Hello, just made my Vlogbrothers video about writing and books and stuff. Uh, came on over here to talk about things, the tweets from Dakota, once you decide on binge writing versus a daily ritual. Um, so I talked about this in the other video, but I do feel like there are times for binge writing and there are times for daily ritual. Um, I, you know, like when I'm working on a climax, I tend to be much more like long stretches, you know, broken up by breaks, but, um, you know, versus when I'm working up, like working up to and doing background and uh, like that stuff is less exciting. And so, and also like it ne I need more time to, like when I'm writing a climax, I know what I'm doing, right? I like, I've, I've worked it all out and I just, I like, need to get it out on the paper and like, I need to keep it all in my head so that I don't make any like mistakes in terms of like, you know, what do they call it in movies? when the cup moves from scene to scene, that. You know what I mean. Throughout the process of a single project, there are like, I'm listening to the book in terms of what it needs. Like, do I need to spend more time off the page doing research, reading other books, getting inspired, you know, thinking about my characters, or, am, or do I know what I'm doing? Like, like, if I know what I'm doing, I'm more, sort of much more suited to binge writing. And if I don't, then it's much more suited to like writing an hour a day and then like seeing the tomorrow if I liked what I wrote and if it was going in the right direction. So I definitely, like, I, I, don't, I, I don't pick and choose one or the other. What in your past has made you a stronger writer? I think the big thing um, is re like reading, definitely. But also writing, like uh, ultimately I write a lot of, like my, my fiction is very non-fiction-y because I write a lot of non-fiction. And so that, that's kind of a cheaty answer. Like writing has made me a better writer, but that's the biggest thing. Um, and, uh, and also um, I think that there's, there's like reading and just enjoying it. And then there's reading and like thinking about why the choices were made reading something that's commercially successful and thinking like, why was this commercially successful? What was it about this that made, got people going? And like, is it, is it as simple as just a good plot that ties itself together well? Or is it something bigger than that? Is it topic? Is it genre? What line of dialogue are you most proud of coming up with? I've got one in the, in the sequel that I really like a lot, but it was Catherine's joke that she made in real life that I put in the book. So I can't really take credit for that one. I like, um, let's see, there's a, there's a time, this is, uh, there's a time when April says, uh, my new favorite kind of fire. I like that line a lot. Um, it won't make any sense if you haven't read the book. Uh, if I, I guess I'm not that proud of it if I don't remember it offhand. Uh, there, there's a lot of non-dialogue, dialogue-y stuff, uh, because April talks like she's speaking to the reader. So, uh, it's kind of everything is dialogue in one way. Now that you have experience in both, do you prefer nonfiction or fiction? Will you be writing a nonfiction book in the future? I am interested in writing a nonfiction book. Uh, I have too many ideas for nonfiction books. It's harder for me to sort of nail one thing down. Nonfiction to me is like very hard and it's sort of like write the oh, like here's everything. I guess could and I've 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 seen that both in my friends who have tried to write nonfiction and in uh in books that I've read by people who I don't know, where I'm just like, you get, sit, get, get a focus. I need you to focus. And that's really hard. Um, so I like, especially because the stuff I want to talk about in a nonfiction book would be pretty, I think, you know, par part of me wants to do a science, like nonfiction science work, whether that's like sort of a history of science thing, which I've always been interested in, or if it's like a exploration of biology through, um, you know, the lens of reproduction, which I'm very interested in, uh, or the, but like also I, the thing I think about most writing is like kind of like vlog brothers E manual for being a human type of stuff or like, how do we handle the next 40 years of, you know, before I'm dead? Like, what does that look like? Um, and how do we do it best kind of book? And that's very hard to put into like, uh, you know, a pitch that you send and say, this is what the book's about. Um, and it's also that would make it very hard to actually write without sort of writing forever and being like, here's the 400,000 words of nonlinear garbage. Uh, but, uh, so I might, nonfiction might be my next book project if I have another one. Like, honestly, I've got, I've 
busy and I don't know. But like, I have found that it incorporates into my lifestyle fairly well. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how I feel about it um, when I'm done with this thing, which is hard to see past. But I, yeah, I really like both. But I will say that like my fiction is very much written as nonfiction. <laughs> and that's another thing that I didn't really know. And then I'm glad that I know now that like the things that I like in books, that doesn't mean that that's the thing that I'm going to write. Like I'm not like I'm not going to write like Hyperion, you know, like Dan Simmons. It's just not going to happen. I'm not that good. Like I'm not that good. I'm not a masterful artist. I, I'm going to write a different kind of thing. And that doesn't mean that like it's not valuable. Um, but I need to like lean into my expertise and lean into like what I'm good at. I'm not really a poet, you know. Um, but I am good at explaining things and, and, uh, telling stories. So you can tell stories in different ways. And just because like, I really love, you know, Hyperion doesn't mean that like me not writing that is some like betrayal of what I love. It's just like, I'm doing the thing that is me. And, uh, and that took me a little while to figure out that like, it was okay to write different than like my favorite books. Like, I'm not just trying to do my favorite book. Um, and that's really freeing. And also, like, it's freeing both in terms of, like, I can do what I want, but also in terms of, like, the amount of pressure that I'm putting on myself uh, to to say, like, this isn't about, like, writing as good as my favorite writers. It's about me writing me way, doing that the best I can, rather than, like, trying to live up to some expectation or standard that I'm never going to live up to. What's your favorite word to type, says... A uh, garage, garage is my favorite word to type. Give it a try. You don't even need this hand. And it goes back and forth between like the index finger, garage, garage. How specific do I need to be with the city my story is set in? Obviously this is like up to everybody. One thing that I uh, have learned and that I really admire other writers for and, and want to and, and trying to get better at is like making the setting a character and like having the place be alive. What did I read recently? Oh, it was this. This, Robin Sloan's Sourdough, uh, where the places were characters, you know? Like they had so much life in them. And I felt like that was a lesson that I was really happy to like be learning from, like to just like see a little bit of how a master was doing it. And uh, I'm not great at that, but, but I think that that like, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and like your city doesn't have to be a real city. Um, I have both real and fake places in my books, uh, that, you know, like, so like New York city, obviously is a real city. The city that April grew up in isn't a real city. Uh, not that that's explored much in the books, but like, it's something I know about. And, um, so like how like real cities are great because you can actually go to them spend time in them you can if you can't go to them you can walk around them in google maps and like at least see how far apart stuff is and you know you can use it and be like tell me how you would take the subway from brooklyn to you know the financial district and it will tell you but like and then in terms of creating a fake city then that is going to be like creating a character it's going to like you you have to take elements of other things that you have experienced and sort of splice them together um along with your own creation. So how specific do you need to be? Like you don't need to be specific at all, but it comes down to whether you want the the place to be its own, it, like have a character and like have a, have like be something, be a part of the story more. And that's like up to each individual story. At what point when writing An Absolute Remarkable Thing did you realize you were going to write a sequel? Um, when I finished <laughs> the book, literally hit the climax and was like, oh no, this is definitely ending. Like I am writing an ending right now. So that's a weird thing to like finishing a book is not like, like finishing a first draft is a wild experience. Um, not that I have had it very many times, <laughs> just once. Uh, but but like being like, it, I'm done. I done it. It's then it like, it wasn't done of course. Like the final book was, 10, 15% longer than what I sent to, out to my agent the first time I sent it out to an agent. Um, but, you know, it was, it was done. It was a, it was a full story. And like, no, like, n ultimately you, you know, when that's happened, when like, like, I'm not, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but like, I'm not 
an outliner. Um, and so like the three act structure is going to come from sort of the like gut level stuff for me. And so when I hit the third act, I was like, oh, there can't be, we're not gonna get to this other stuff that is part of the story for me unless we like start up a whole new three act structure, which you can do in one book, but I'm not going to because uh, it, it's a lot more words. Um, turns out the second book is almost definitely significantly more words than the first book. Not like double or anything, but more. How do I plot and make it cohesive? I talked about this in the other video, but um, how do you plot and make it cohesive? Um, it's, it's about holding a lot of information in your head and also using tools to augment that. Because obviously I still can't remember the term for when you know, you had a cane in one scene and an umbrella in the other one. It's still not in there. So I can't hold everything in my head, especially not that, which is a continuity. Ah, <sighs> good, I'm not completely losing it. So you gotta hold a lot of stuff in your head, but you also have to have to use the tools at your disposal to help you hold stuff in your head. Um, I use Scrivener to write and like lots of people use lots of different things. John just writes in Word, I think. Um, but I use Scrivener and that gives me a place to put character outlines, which are really helpful for minor characters for me. For major characters, I don't need to do, I've never done a character outline for a major character because like it, it's, they'd sort of like live inside my head. But for minor characters, it's like, what did this person do for a living? What does their hair look like? How tall are they? How do they dress? You know, like it gives me that information so that, and, and minor characters, it's really important to do that stuff. This is something I learned. Who did I learn this from? It was a, it was a, they're like books that have lots of characters and they do a really great job of helping me. I think Harry Potter does a good job of this, um, but I don't know if that's who I was thinking of. Oh, uh, Michael Connolly does, does this really well. Uh, y you, um, you, you, you have to, not only in your own mind, if you're having a hard time keeping your character straight, your minor character straight in your own mind, you need to give something for other people to to latch on to. So like somewhat of a bizarre name helps, um, sort of like any linguistic or verbal tick, or like you mentioned their shaggy hair every time they come on screen, or you mentioned that they're always wearing a band t-shirt or something like, Oh, this is the band T-shirt guy. Oh, this is the this is the guy with the funny name. He's called Trunky Trunk uh, by his friends, and you know, like Bosch novel, like Michael Connelly novels are full of like every like this is this person's name, but everybody calls them this because they're such a hard ass or whatever, and and that helps you latch onto these characters, especially early on before they get developed. Um, but in general. That was not your question, but but I think that in terms of plot, also characters, ha like using things that can supplement your knowledge of your story and like store information so that you can go back and look is really valuable. Also writing short stories helps with this and like can flex that muscle. Um, and I've never published a short story. I've published one short story, um, but a shorter story lets you have a more cohesive plot and you don't have to hold as much stuff in your head at the same time. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about some things soon about this. Do your characters ever refuse what, to do what you want them to do? They don't refuse to do what I want them to do because ultimately I want them to do the thing that they want to do, but they do refuse to get themselves into the places where I need them to be. Uh, and then you you just have to write around it. Like it's, I, like, I think that it's really important for there to be pillars of your story that like, this is, you can't, like it's the load supporting wall. Like you can't knock that down or the whole building comes down. There are things you just don't touch. And uh, and so you like make them and you're like, I'm not gonna touch that. I'm not gonna change that. I'm gonna work around that problem. And that is gonna look, because we had to work around that problem, it's gonna feel much more real to the audience, um, to the reader. Audiences, I'm the YouTuber, folks, uh, to the viewers <laughs> of, the, of your book. And and to me, characters are that. If you are changing them, then uh, the, like it's a big it's a big deal. You can do it, but um, but you have but like it it matters a lot. And to me, like characters are like the supporting columns of the story structure. And so, if you're gonna move that over a little bit, like 
there's a lot of change that has to happen to accommodate it. I did that in an absolutely remarkable thing. Um, April, April, what happened was April sort of like came more into herself as I wrote. And then when I went back and read the beginning again, I was like, oh, not quite, not consistent. And so had to rework her like first couple chapters to make it feel real. And I, you know, I, as I reread the book, um, that consistency, that's another thing. Like revision is so important in all of this. Like when you're done with a book and then you reread the whole book, you're like, you change one or two words here that just like makes that person much more consistent throughout the book because you have like by the end of the book, you have a much fuller idea of who the person is. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Says Mandy. Several people asked this question. This is a new term that I heard sometime in this year, very much in relation to Game of Thrones. Uh, plotters are people who sort of like set their whole plot out and they outline and they know where the story is going when they start. Pantsers are like, let's put a bunch of people into a place and then we're going to go by the seat of our pants and see what happens. And like, nobody is purely either of these things, I'm convinced. Um, I, it, the very, maybe there are pure plotters out there um, who do not let inspiration sway them during the process of writing. I don't, maybe, especially people who are like very need to be productive people, like who write just a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but, but I'm convinced that pantsers also plot. Like, um, I th I've also heard of like a gardening metaphor where it's more like, like do you sort of like throw seeds down? But like once you throw the seeds down, you still have to like move stuff around and, and like take out, like you have to to have to weed and you have to thin and like, so all that stuff is still happening. Um, but I'm a pantser for sure. Uh, when I, but like what, what I start out with in terms of plot tends to be a destination, um, a like a starting point, and then like two to three things I want to see along the way. And the, the story becomes exciting for me when I have that um, without. And then what happens is like on the way to those cool, interesting events, other cool, interesting events happen. And like you put those in and like, and ultimately like who knows is like, Maybe one of those things that I really thought was a really great thing is going to get cut completely. Maybe it's going to be like much less interesting than some of the things that I came up with just while I was writing. Like the dream, for example, in the first book is entirely a pants thing. I was like getting to a point in the story where I was like, well, I know where we're going, but there isn't there isn't like enough stuff here to to bridge the gap. And like, I love mysteries, like weird, you know, created mysteries. Um, that that people have to go through i love scavenger hunts and that kind of thing so like finding that um was like well maybe there's a scavenger hunt and i was like well what kind of scavenger hunt would there be how would it function and it was just like just just wasn't in the book until i got to it and and then as soon as i created it like that section of the book wrote itself very quickly so pants are for sure and uh but like you know also a ravenous uh, thinner, like I, you know, I think by virtue of pantsing, you write a lot of stuff that isn't necessary. And so, you know, I, in the revision process, do a full reread of the book and then find the stuff that really, really doesn't need to be there. And, and I have always been like, by virtue of Vlogbrothers largely, extremely opposed to excess um, uh, information you know, like, like if it's not doing at least two things, I don't think, feel like it should be in the book. Uh, so I cut a lot. I cut, and I cut individual words, especially in narration. I don't do it as much. And I'm, I'm, I'm more okay letting people's dialogue contain superfluousness than I am letting like my writing contain superfluousness in terms of like narration and exp 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 exposition. There it is. Huh. It's been not a lot of sleep for me lately. Uh, and and that's also like, you know, that's kind of specific to April's style as well. So if I ever write another novel uh, after the sequel, then it will be interesting to see if I can like get out of writing as April May.
because I've done that so much. Uh, I'm writing a D&D campaign, any advice? I love this question. I think that it's probably not super different from writing a novel. And one reason why I like D&D campaigns so much is because in general, we see, um, we see like creative endeavors as things that should be mass consumed writing definitely we don't see and and there are there are worlds in which this is less the case like the world there's like a great community of short story science fiction that i uh read a lot of that stuff that isn't ever going to have a huge audience um but i'm a big fan of and uh so like i'm a i'm a clark's world subscriber if you are interested in that you should subscribe to clark's world they have a patreon and they're amazing, uh, but you could also get, it's all free. Like you don't need to pay for it, but you, if you like what the work, like they do amazing editing, they find great, great work. And the, you know, I'm very rarely disappointed by a story in Clark's world. Um, so check, check it out. And they also have a podcast where it's read to you and you can listen to it in your ears instead of an audiobook, which costs money. It's amazing. What world do we live in? This is why I support them on Patreon. Uh, so, but I think D and D campaigns are stories written for very small audiences and, and in a way that's like, not like no one will judge you for it. Like, this is the thing, this is what you're supposed to do. And, and so I love it as a way of, you know, like scratching that itch. Right. So I think it, but I think it's very similar. Uh, the difference, of course, being that like sometimes you have to pants because your players are going to do things that you do not expect them to do. And uh, if you filled out enough of the world, then and you understand uh, you understand the mechanics of the world, you understand the motivations of your villains, you understand uh, like you understand sort of like what they might like what what ultimately they're going to discover then you can pants effectively. So that's really what it is, I, I think. Like in a D&D campaign, not that I've ever done this, but I've like witnessed other people do it and I'm in awe of it, um, is is about like, you create, you, you are not writing the story, you are writing the world and you're under, and you like need to understand the characters, like the non-player characters very deeply in order to sort of like handle it when you're, when your players throw you a loop and you're only like an hour into your session. A lot of writing that is about uh, about the world rather than about like what's actually happening. Grace, how do you uh, write about the seemingly mundane and make it readable and exciting? Juxtaposition is how I do it. So like big, important, huge things are happening. La, 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 and then it's like, whew, let's talk about like, like just going through a day of our lives. And like, and that gives you a chance like gives the reader a chance to like reset a little bit, think, connect with the characters a little bit, and like gives the characters a chance to communicate with the readers, um, which my characters do directly. Um, so that, yeah, man, I, I don't like. I don't. It doesn't necessarily have to be exciting. It has to be readable. It has to be interesting. And ultimately, like, I have a fair amount of experience making things that might seem mundane more exciting, which I do in nonfiction a lot. Uh, and a lot of that is depth. So you you just go deeper. And like the deeper you go, the more you're like, oh, actually this is super fascinating and weird. And that can be done with things that actually exist. It can also be done by th with things that don't exist. Like Becky, Becky Chambers is great at this. Um, creating m sort of like the beautiful mundane, uh, but in, in a world that isn't ours. So like we have our beautiful mundanes, but like if you're if you're in like far future sci-fi or fantasy or something, they're going to have different mundane things. They're going to have different rituals, different like celebrations of coming of age or like every society has these, but creating one from scratch is like she does that really fantastically and like that draws you so much into the world because it makes you curious about like how these people live their lives and it it really gives you depth. If you if you haven't read Becky Chambers, I cannot tell you more times how much, how special those books are. Be surprised if you cry, but you pri might be because you because you're sad, but like more likely because you're happy. Yeah. So ask Becky, uh, Tom, as someone who does as many things as you do, what are things, uh, what things are you able to do that help you cope with p potential situations that may occur with IBD? Um, 
This is mostly is a problem for deadlines, meetings, uh, live events, and one is communicating. Uh, like I was having a flare recently and wasn't sure, like it wasn't sure like what the situation was re my paperback release. And so like they wanted me to do some events around the paperback and I was like, give, let me get through my colonoscopy and like I'll tell you then and like everybody was super understanding and so I am doing some events I'm not doing a ton but I'm doing some like there are also things that I can do specifically for like two hour period of safety you know drugs I can take um and I've experienced with experimented with that travel can also be hard if if it's like during a flare like obviously not having access to a bathroom during takeoff and landing or turbulence is bad uh and so like that's that's the the practicalities of working around that. But in terms of like, ultimately writing is a career that does actually mesh better with IBD or freelancing in general, because like, like for example, my mornings tend to be bad. And so I just don't schedule stuff in the mornings. Uh, and then if I'm writing during that time, then like, it doesn't matter if I like have to stop or I can take my laptop to the bathroom with me, uh, which I've not never done. <laughs> and also I give myself a break, you know? I. I know that like ultimately that like everyone has limitations and like that might just be like the limitations of our own minds. Like we, we are all limited by our minds, not like my mind is better than yours, but like there, there is a limit at which like a human mind cannot like function past a certain capacity. You can't write faster than a certain amount. And like I, but like, I also have this other limitation that is, you know, my, you know, chronic disease, but like other people have different chronic diseases that I don't have. And like, we all have limitations. And so like, just understanding that this is like, this is my normal and this is my speed. And like, this is, and like when I'm having, when I'm sick, like, and if I can't do something, then like, I can't do it. And that's okay. I'm just gonna watch a TV show that I'm probably gonna watch anyway, eventually. So, uh, so that's another thing that I, that I tend to think about <laughs> is like, if I, I'm going to watch The Expanse, you know, I like it's the it expanse comes out. I'm going to watch it eventually. I sh I shouldn't be ashamed for watching it when like maybe I have a deadline because like I'm gonna watch it, right? Uh, if I'm watching something that I don't love, then that's a problem. And like I do that, you know, if I'm watching like boxing clips on YouTube, which has not never happened, then like that's not a great use of my time. But eventually I'm gonna watch the expanse. And so like this is this is time that will be spent doing this one way or another. Uh, so I don't, I don't get down on myself for that. Fiction titles are difficult. Nonfiction titles are boring. Which do you like better? For clarity, fiction titles are difficult. Nonfiction titles are difficult. Like titling a video is a freaking thing, man. Especially nowadays when click-through rates matter so much. Uh, uh, but I do, for clarity, I hate them both. <laughs> it's, it's wild that you can like spend, uh, you know, a lot of time, hundreds of hours working on hundreds of thousands of words, but then you can spend like 20 hours working on four words. And that's, that, that's, we haven't named the sequel yet, which is not through lack of trying. But I think that would be equally hard to name a nonfiction book. I Like, I think that non naming a nonfiction book, like you gotta, especially those little subheads that they have, they've all got great subheads. Let's pick one out. This one's called Careful, A User's Guide to Our Injury-Prone Minds. See that, like people worked hard on that. The, I guess the thing is like, oftentimes they have like that one word title, Careful or like Deep Economy, Epic Measures. Epic Measures is a good title. Uh, got like some, some, some old feminist stuff, The Chalice and the Blade. That's a great freaking title. That's a great title for a nonfiction book. The Poisoned City? Oh yeah, this book, ugh. That's a great title. Dr. Tatiana's Sex Advice to All Creation, great title. How do you keep your focus on the task and avoid distractions of constantly updating things like Twitter? Yes, I understand the irony of asking here. I don't. I ultimately, like, I, like for my books, I have to understand social media and I have to market them. So like, those are two different reasons to be on Twitter. Um, and I get drawn back in when I probably shouldn't sometimes, but 
Uh, but I also find it to be a source of inspiration. I'm um, almost running out of batteries here, so let's let's speed along and see if we can get through everybody's. What would happen to your currently unfinished novel if you died? This person asks. I've written my editor about how I think it ends, which, <clears throat> you know, that's how George Martin did it. Uh, I wrote like a basically summary, like when I got to the point where I kind of knew how it was going to end, I like wrote it all down, which is actually really great for me too, because then I had an outline. Let me write a lot faster. What's your favorite thing to write? Character development, betrayals, world building. I love climaxes. I don't love betrayals. I love fights. I like I like to write fights between characters. I like to write like active antagonism. Uh, I like it when I cry. Uh, I like togetherness. Um, but I also I like you know I like to write those scenes where everything sort of comes together and it's like oh my god. So I hope I can do that. How do I not hate everything I write? Uh, if you hate what you're writing, it's because you have good, like you have taste at least, like you know what you don't like about it. Um, my advice is to, if you if you hate what you're writing as you're writing it, ignore that because that's lies. If you hate what you're writing after you've written it and given it a day or two and you come back and read it, that like what you know, what what don't you like about it? And like, go and look at what you like about some other things that you like and like change it. Um, that's like, I often will hate what I'm writing when I'm writing it and then come back and be like, well, this is like 80% good. <laughs> uh, do you ever have two very good, but this is from Viheart, but contradictory ideas for where a story should go? How do you choose and what alternate Hank, universe, Hank universes have we missed out on? Yeah, I usually find one that I like a lot. Usually I'm like, oh, I, mm. uh, it, it tends to be that like, uh, I write like the first thing that comes to my mind and sometimes that's the thing. And then if I have another idea, usually it's so much better than what I've, that, than what I've written, then I, that I like immediately delete it. That, this doesn't always happen. Sometimes I like work very hard back and forth between like, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I can't talk about that because it's sequel stuff. Um, so that's what's really present in my mind right now. But but yeah, absolutely. And I can't tell you what alternate Hank universes you've missed out on. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, yes, very like two good but contradictory ideas does happen. And um, and then I I pick based on what I think the reader will like more. And how do I decide what a reader will like more? Well, my friends, I have no idea. If I could explain how consciousness works, then I'd have a very high paying job at Google. Google!